So now let us begin with our presentations. And I'd like to start with our first speaker, who, who needs no introduction to many of you. Professor José Schasch is director of the Group, Group of Earth Observations Secretariat in Geneva, Switzerland. Professor Schaas studied, he studied geophysics in France and in the United States. He began his career professionally at the Institut de Physique du Globe de Paris um, here in Paris, where he created a Department of Space Studies. More recently, Professor Ashash um, has served uh, in key positions at the French Space Agency, CNES, as well as the European Space Agency, ESA, where he served as Director of Earth Observations. Under his leadership at ESA, the GMES program of Global Monitoring for Earth, uh, for Environment and Security was created. We've asked Professor Ashash to begin our seminar tonight um, and to set the stage for the remaining presentations. So with no further ado, Professor Ashash, we look forward to hearing from you. Well, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, good evening. Thank you very much all for coming tonight on a Sunday. Not a brilliant Sunday, but still. And um, to discuss uh, GEOS, the need for Earth observation, the challenges that uh, uh, we are meeting today. It is, it is clear that uh, we are now facing a number of challenges regarding our environment and our economies, even our uh, political systems, which are population growth, uh, biodiversity changes, and climate change, obviously. I, I can testify that uh, I had never heard of a French monsoon before today, so it seems that uh, we do have uh, obvious changes in the, in the climate patterns. So to respond to this, these challenges, we will have to, uh, to invent responses, smart responses. And I guess these responses will come from two parallel efforts. One will be on the technologies. There will be new technologies for uh, new energies, new technologies for solar cells, for wind turbines, for clean coal. There will be new technologies for clean water. There will be uh, new technologies for buildings, for insulations, and for transportation. But besides these uh, technological solutions, technological responses, uh, a second part will be more political and will require information, will require informed decisions. And, uh, a good example is biofuels, uh, about which there's a lot of discussion today, a lot of uh, hope. But I guess the consequences of biofuel in many directions, including simply water, has never, ever been discussed. We know that the major problem we have today on, on this planet is uh, uh, the, the amount of water. And 75% uh, of the water available for drinking, which is just 1% of the water available on the planet, but out of this 1%, 75% goes to agriculture. So if we start building uh, uh, new energies using biofuels, we will run into a catch because we will need more water and we don't have it. So this is a subject on which information is needed. And there are many others. So to address these challenges, we will need an information system for the planet. And this information system is, in fact, the GEOS. So presumably there was supposed to be a more interesting slide on the, on the screen, which uh, uh, this one, yeah, it's much better than my face, uh, which is a, a sort of a simplified description of uh, what GEOS is. It's a global coordinated, comprehensive, and sustained system of observing systems. That is, it will bring information from all the possible resources, satellites, of course, airplanes, balloons, but also in situ, and try and address a number of uh, societal benefit areas. There are nine of them which have been recognized so far, but there could be more. And provide the information to support the decisions to respond to the needs of, of, uh, of our society in a number of areas. These decisions could be in the form of these decision support tools could be in the forms of forecasts, of maps, or simply scenarios. And they will be uh, addressing, as I said, nine societal benefit areas, disaster, health, energy, climate, water, the weather, ecosystems, agriculture, and biodiversity. 
GEO started a long time, uh, I mean a short time ago, it was created two years ago. The very first idea of the, uh, of the system was uh, three and a half years ago, hardly four years. And we, we've created a very, very small organization. I mean the Secretariat of GEO in Geneva is uh, 16 people. But we have a huge objective, a huge mission, which is to bring together all these observing systems. So the key words are coordination, coordinating the existing observing systems. And if you think about it, we've not been very successful so far on this. In space, which is an example that well known from this audience, we have managed to uh, coordinate maybe on, at, uh, at the bilateral level on a few cases. Topex Poseidon was a good example of coordination between France and the US. Certainly the uh, uh, polar orbiting uh, satellites for metrology, uh, METOP and NPOS have been another very good, uh, very successful effort of the US and UMETSAT. But uh, the A-train could be given as another example, but these are very few. I guess the only really successful examples of global coordination to me would be the Algo uh, network of uh, buoys in the, in the ocean that uh, was initiated by Jim Baker, which is uh, with us tonight, um, and, and continued by, by NOAA and, uh, and all his, uh, his, um, uh, the other agencies. Argo is an example where 20 or 25 different organizations join forces to establish a global network of in-situ observing systems. Probably the Federation of Digital Seismic Networks is another example, but probably much less well known. So what we're trying to do is develop synergies between these systems, try and get more value for money for the governments and the operators of these systems because by launching all the systems independently of each other, I mean the value we get from the, and the information we can extract from this system is hardly, I mean a few percent of what we could get if we would jointly operate all these in situ systems. And the other key word is sustainability because probably 80 to 90 percent of these observing systems that we are using today have been funded by research and development uh, uh, funds, meaning that uh, scientists decided to operate a satellite or go and study the, the poles for the next two years during the international polar year. But what then? Who will make sure that these data which are needed for probably decades will be sustainably maintained? beyond the duration of this specific scientific uh, project. And this is a key, key question, and I'll come back to that in my conclusion. How can we make sure that we ensure the sustainability of this observing system, which is needed if we want to make an information system to support decision making, but it's also needed for scientists, because this issue we're facing, the processes we're discussing are processes which develop on decayed timescales, and therefore have to be observed for 20 to 30 years before we can actually say what is happening and understand it happens. So an information system of system to support decision making for the public, for governments of course, but also for the private sector. So let me go very quickly through uh, some examples. In the public domain, early warning systems are certainly the example of uh, systems that are more urgently needed and where improvements are needed. We have good uh, warning systems for hurricanes, for fast developing disasters in general, but for hurricanes we have very good ones. That's a very successful example of, uh, where, uh, of uh, an example where we've been successful, but for slowly developing disasters like droughts, we're not there yet for white lawn fires. We don't have the, the, the right warning systems. Even for earthquakes and tsunamis, things can be more complicated than what we thought. And there's no way we can make a prediction for an earthquake which takes 15 minutes to actually develop. The reason why we didn't have a warning on, on this Andaman earthquake is because none of our software was able to understand an earthquake which starts at a moment and is still shaking, is still breaking the, the crust 15 minutes later. This had never happened and none of our software was able to understand that. There's, so there's room for science uh, still if we want to uh, develop more uh, warning systems, but we need the observing system, we don't have it. Epidemics 
is another example where observing systems can be very efficient. We know how to relate specific environmental conditions with outbreaks of cholera and, um, and meningitis, for instance. There are two benefits to that. One is, of course, if you can anticipate the outbreak, you can plan the vaccination. But there's a second one, which sounds a bit uh, weird, but it's all, uh, probably as useful for WHO and the local players, is to be able to anticipate the end of an outbreak. Because when, if you know that but in two weeks the outbreak will be over because the second rainy season will stop the meningitis outbreak, for instance, then you stop vaccinating people. And you, you're saving millions, tens of millions of dollars in vaccination because you, you don't do this useless vaccination. And these are models that uh, we have today, uh, provided we have the right information. Another example where observation and monitoring will be useful is geoengineering. I mean, there are more and more changes implemented on this planet uh, or out of, we, of, of which the consequences we, we don't really know. Well, you heard about this idea of putting iron in the ocean. Now it's challenged on the, I mean, basically challenged as uh, not uh, being operational. But there are other examples of uh, today India, for instance, is, uh, is beginning to uh, shape the catchments of some rivers by moving hills from in places so that the, they could uh, change the flow of rivers and the flow of uh, surface water to uh, generate irrigation in areas which have not been irrigated. Without understanding the consequences of that, the US people know of the Dust Bowl history and what happens when you don't uh, actually uh, properly model, anticipate the consequences of these changes. But the private sector might as well be interested in, uh, in um, in a system like GEOS, and I think it's, a, I'll tell you later why I think it's very important to involve the private sector. Well, the insurance company is a good example where, um, and you've probably read in the, in the papers lately, that uh, if the rate and the, the size of the uh, uh, disasters keeps increasing, then insurance company will, not, will simply not be able to insure them anymore, and they will turn to government to actually insure risk beyond a certain threshold. Well, whether the governments will be able to pay for that is still arguable, and presumably the markets will have to uh, come in with uh, derivatives to, uh, to spread the risk so that uh, it can be faced. I am being asked to conclude. Um, just give you a second example before I go to come to my conclusion, which is the valuation of uh, ecosystem services. Uh, in, in many cases, we, uh, we, uh, we are today in a situation where we would be able to uh, attract investments, private funds, to improve environmental conditions, protect equatorial forests, or protect some specific environments. In order to do that, we have to demonstrate that there's a value in these environments, an economic value in these environments, so that there could be a return on investment. And the New Yorkers probably knew of, know of the, the Catskills catchment, which, was, which is this forest which was making the cleanest water in, in, in a city and on this planet. It was in New York. And when this, the, the water in New York started deteriorating, they computed that uh, cleaning the water in New York would cost 10, million, 10 billions over 10 years, and restoring the Catskills environment would cost only 1 billion. So it was an immediate decision to make the right investment. I conclude by saying two things. First of all, that uh, the real value of GEOS is uh, if, it's, uh, if it can benefit all, developed countries as well as developing countries. And later this year, on 13 November, we will have the first ministerial summit since GEO was formally created. The Cape Town ministerial summit is going to be in Cape Town in Africa. It's going to be drawing a number of... Uh, themes uh, and achievements uh, which are specific to developing countries and particularly Africa and will echo five years after the, the World Summit on Sustainable Development how far we've gone into putting space and earth observation and science to the benefit of uh, sustainable uh, economic growth in, in developing countries. The second, uh, uh, and this is a uh, this is going to be an important uh, event at which uh, we're going to be discussing a key issue underlying the GEOS, which is the, the ability to share the data freely between all the partners. And data sharing is going to be a key issue for the success of uh, GEOS. 
And my final conclusion is, is more on who's going to pay for that. Um, I was reading a study from the EOCD, thanks to uh, Pierre Nashib, uh, uh, two weeks ago, which evaluate that in the next 20 years, on public infrastructure for water, telecommunication, transport, and, um, and energy, developing countries will be investing somewhere uh, uh, in around $70 trillion to restore, maintain, and develop the necessary public infrastructures. With public spending and public earnings actually reducing, there's no way governments are going to be able to pay for that. So they will start developing PPPs, public-private partnerships, all sorts of other, um, I mean, joint funding mechanisms. What is GEOS? It's a public infrastructure. It's, an inform it's a public infrastructure that will be globally shared to support public information and decision making. Therefore, it will have to be counted among these public infrastructures, this investment for public infrastructures. And I think we'll have to find mechanisms to include PPPs in, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in the development of GEOS. And uh, lately we've been discussing at GEO the possibility of contributing to this Iridium Next uh, uh, constellation, which will put uh, uh, observing systems on this telecommunication. Uh, I mean, have the, we have the opportunity to put these uh, systems on this telecommunication constellation. The only way to do that will be to find some sort of a PPP to do this. But I guess this is going to be true for the whole of the uh, GEOS, and uh, I think we will have to be creative in this, uh, in this part. And I um, apologize for having clearly exploded my time.